Hello, and welcome to episode 33 of the Bible Q&A with Pastor Stephen. My name is Stephen Pace, and I'm the senior pastor at Decatur Bible Church in Decatur, Michigan. This podcast attempts to answer Bible questions in a clear but thorough manner. If you would like to have a Bible-related question considered for a future episode, you can email me your question to Pastor Stephen DBC at gmail.com. Again, that's Pastor S T E V E N D B C at gmail.com. In this episode, we're going to be looking at three Bible questions. So before we get started, go ahead and grab your Bibles. Now, for our first question, I'm just going to read the question. Pastor, thanks for the explanation on baptism by immersion. Are there any verses that show someone being immersed? So this question is a follow-up question, if you could tell from the question itself. In episode 32, so the previous episode, there was a question about immersion. In other words, the question was, where do we get the idea of immersing someone in the water versus, for example, perhaps sprinkling, for example. So in the last episode, 32, I looked at the word for baptism, which is in Greek, baptizio, and the word itself means to dip. Um, So that's where we get the idea of dipping or to immerse something into water. And so we come away with the idea that baptism is by immersion. It means to dip or to plunge something, literally in the Greek, in that case into water. So from that, you see the question is, so the question is, is there anything in the Bible that we can look to where this actually occurred? So we're going to look at two passages. These would be the two main ones that would often be referenced and probably familiar perhaps with both but more likely at least the first one so for the first example we're going to look at Matthew chapter 3 Matthew chapter 3 and we'll be looking at verse 16 now in Matthew chapter 3 we have the ministry there of John the Baptist and then John is known to be baptizing at the River Jordan or the Jordan River, Jesus approaches him and wants to be baptized. You'll notice that after the dialogue in verses 13 through 15, John goes forward and baptizes Jesus. But let's read verse 16. So again, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. After being baptized... Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and the Spirit of God descending on him as a dove. So, if you notice there, of course, after they're going to proceed with Jesus' baptism, it says, after being baptized, you'll notice it says, Jesus came up immediately from the water. So, the idea there is that he was in the water in the Jordan River, and he comes up out of the water. And again, that fits well with the word that's just a few words before it, which is baptism, baptizio. He went down into the water. He was plunged, dipped into the water, and then comes out of the water. And in most of the English translations, we have the same thing. Uh, you can, for instance, it's almost the essentially the same In the New King James, it says, When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. So again, you still have the same idea of being immersed into something dipped or to plunge something. Uh, I like the idea of dipping because if you look back at the original question in episode 32, that's actually where the origin of the question was. We had a baptism at church recently. And the individual was dipped into the water. 
and so that was where the question actually originates from and we see that there as well this idea of dipping into the water but let's look at another location and it's in the book of Acts Acts chapter 8 and verses 38 through 39 so again Acts 8 38 through 39 now this one is what we think of in regards to the Ethiopian that Philip encounters. The Ethiopian had been reading from the prophet Isaiah. You see that in verses 32 through 33. And he asked Philip in verse 34 to help him to understand what the prophet was saying. And so as you keep reading it, verse 35, for example, 36, 37, Philip goes on to explain that the scripture that he was referring to, the aforementioned Isaiah passage, Isaiah 53, verse 7, in fact, he said that he explained who Jesus was from the scripture, the eunuch believed, and then wanted to be baptized. And Philip gives him the, the condition, you might say, verse 37, where he needs to first make sure he's believed, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, after affirming that, the chariot stops, you'll notice, in verse 38. So we're going to pick up there in verse 38. So the eunuch has trusted in Christ based on his hearing and understanding of what the prophet Isaiah had said. So let's pick up in verse 38. And he ordered the chariot to stop, so that's the eunuch. They both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. Verse 39, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. So somewhat similar uh, to the passage in Matthew chapter 3 with the Lord Jesus' baptism. Here, the eunuch with Philip goes down into the water, and then they come up out of the water. So again, you have this same idea of they're going into the water, coming up out of it, and you see that as well. Uh, most translations translate it pretty much the same, but again, the idea is to dip or to plunge into the water. Now, I'm going to read something. This comes from Thomas Constable's expository notes, and he's referring to this passage. He says, quote, Obviously, there was enough water for Philip to immerse the Ethiopian. They both went down into the water. This was the normal method of baptism in Judaism and early Christianity. Some interpreters have argued, however, that the two men may have stood in the water while Philip poured water over or sprinkled the Ethiopian. This is a possibility, but... In my opinion, likely improbable. The normal meaning of the Greek word baptizio, to baptize, is to immerse, and this was the common custom. So I read that to you just to kind of clarify uh, that a little bit, and that's where, as the question is asking is, what is baptism in terms of the method? And baptism in terms of the method I believe, and uh, the church that I pastor, Decatur Bible Church, we believe that is best understood as immersion. We see from the Greek word baptizio, that means to dip, and in both the examples with Jesus as well as the Ethiopian eunuch, both of them went down into the water. It's also, of course, the practice that Judaism would have had at the time, as well as Christianity, as I quoted. So hopefully that helps clarify that question in terms of is there any examples of immersion and those would be the two uh, that one would likely turn to for that. Now as we go into the second question, if you listen to any of the previous podcasts, you know often I like to try to do a trivia question. This episode's trivia question is after slaying Goliath, what did David keep in his tent as a souvenir? 
So again, let me read the question to you. After slaying Goliath, what did David keep in his tent as a souvenir? Uh, you could probably say instead of a souvenir, a keepsake of what occurred with that encounter. So to answer the question, we'll need to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we'll be looking at verse 54. Now we're probably familiar with David and Goliath, the story of that, one of the more well-known of the entirety of the Bible, not just the Old Testament. But David, of course, accepts the challenge to go up against Goliath. He prevails against Goliath, of course, ultimately, of course, prevailing over him. And then afterwards, what does David keep? In other words, to remember that. And we'll actually find the answer, interestingly enough, in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 54. There we see it says, Then David took the Philistine's head and brought it into Jerusalem, but he put his weapons in his tent. So the answer to that question, and the question was, what did David keep, in other words, for himself? So we see in verse 54, we know he took the Philistine's head. You may have seen there are paintings and artist renditions of the battle, and one of the aspects of him taking the head. Here he takes it to Jerusalem, but you'll notice it says, but he kept Goliath's weapons in his tent. So that's the answer to the question. So after slaying Goliath, David kept Goliath's weapons with him, whereas he actually took the head to Jerusalem. Now for our third and final question. Pastor, I read in the book recently two terms. What is meant by, or can you clarify what is meant by general versus special revelation. So let me state the question again, having read two books recently, what is meant by or can you clarify the difference between general and special revelation? So that's the question there. And this is a good question, uh, the idea of revelation. Obviously, the first thought we might think of is the book of Revelation, which is not in any case here what we're thinking of. But revelation here is what God, in a sense, reveals to mankind. And so as you try to understand what's the difference between general or special revelation, sometimes general might be called natural, but uh, general is helpful. The first thing you need to remember is that this question is rooted in that God reveals himself primarily through two means or through two ways and you can see that even in the question the idea is how does God reveal i.e. revelation how does he reveal himself to humanity and uh, good question so let's start with the first one which is general revelation general revelation I'm just going to read a definition in fact for both of these but the first one is for general revelation and then later we'll read one on special it's by the moody handbook of theology and they do a good job of defining it here it says in terms of general revelation the truths god has revealed about himself to all mankind through nature providential control and conscience so again it's the truth revealed by god about himself it's to all of mankind. It comes through nature, uh, providential control, and conscience. I think that's a good definition there because it covers a lot of the main ideas there of general revelation. The general revelation is rooted in the knowledge of who God is. How does God do that? Well, he does it through a variety of means. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to give you some examples of this. and We won't read all of the passages, but I'll give you some examples and you can begin to see this. Because general revelation is just that. It's general in its nature and it's available to everyone. And that's good about the definition. All of humanity has this revealing of God. Uh, let's look at a few of these verses here and... Uh, 
I'm going to read from Psalm 19. Psalm 19 is a good one. Probably have heard it before, but it does a good job of describing not only the works, but the Word of God. Psalm 19 begins, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring of the works of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the earth. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, and its current to the other end of them. There is nothing hidden from its heat. So if you just look at that right there, you can see the idea of God reveals himself through, as we just read, nature. In other words, the creation that we all have around us. And so we see that God has power in terms of creating things, the universe. Uh, I like this particular one that David describes here because it describes that creation tells of God's glory and how things work in creation. So when you think of general revelation, God reveals himself through nature, through creation. One way to think about that, if you struggle with that, is one only needs to look around at the complexities, the fine-tuning of creation, to know that there had to be someone who made it. We might think in very simple terms, a creator. Someone had to have bring it, brought it forth. And, of course, the psalmist is saying, it's God. The one who brought it forth is God himself. Let's look at another passage in the New Testament, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, because this one, and we won't read all of these verses, but I would encourage you to read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, because you can see throughout here, Paul's dealing largely here with unbelief and the consequences on humanity for unbelief, but through this, you can see where God has revealed himself, and man is not without knowledge. In other words, he's not without evidence that there is a creator. Now, obviously, he may not understand who that is. He may not know. But there's at least a general knowledge that there is a God. I'm going to read just the first few verses of Romans chapter 1, verse 18, beginning there. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Notice verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So again, I would encourage you, if you're interested read verses 18 through 32 and you can see very clearly that God has revealed himself enough to humanity would be Paul's main point there that they're not without knowledge because there is a creator and he's revealed himself there's a few other ones you could look at Acts 14 verse 17 speaks about how he has providential control over nature Again, that's Acts 14, verse 17. One other one, which is a, seems out of place, perhaps, but in Matthew chapter 5, it relates to his goodness. And Matthew records the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 45, though, what we see is that it says, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. The idea is that God even gives his goodness. In those cases, in that case, you see two contrasted extremes. You see between sending rain, but the rain goes on whom? Well, not just the righteous, but the unrighteous. And the sun rises on not just the good, but on the evil. The idea is that God has revealed 
his goodness to both, both meaning the righteous and unrighteous, the evil and the good. So basically what we would come away with is that general revelation is just that, it's general. It's revealed to everyone, all of mankind. And I like to think of it as it should trigger, at least in the thinking of, of humans, that the creation is so glorious, it's so fine-tuned, it's with so much precision, and it's so unique that clearly someone made it. Alas, who made it? And as the psalmist says, God. And so God reveals himself in a general way. Now the second part of the question is, what is special revelation? So I'll read from Moody's Handbook of Theology on this, and it says, The divine revealing of truth through Jesus Christ and through the Scriptures. So again, special revelation is just that. It's unique, it's special, it's not general, but rather it reveals truth this way, though, through whom. It's In other words, what's the means of revealing truth? It's Jesus Christ, but also through the Scriptures couple of things you can think about with this is God reveals through what we would think of as direct communication. That's Acts 22 verses 17 through 21. So you could look there for um, the idea of what we would think of as directly communicating uh, to unique individuals and in unique situations. Acts 22 verses 17 through 21. Sometimes of course that is visions and dreams. Uh, we are going through the book of Daniel on Sunday mornings, and that would be an idea there as well in the book of Daniel. We know that Jesus, of course, came to reveal God, the Logos, as he's called, the Word of God in John chapter 1. But in John chapter 1 and verse 14, it says the Word became flesh. And one of Jesus' purposes, of course, was to reveal God to us. I like to think of it as a way in ways we could at least to some degree, comprehend. So special revelation is the idea of just that, God revealing certain truth, and the truth is revealed to and through the Scriptures and through Jesus Christ. And in terms of the Scriptures themselves, you could look at, for example, John chapter 21 in verse 25. So again, the answer to the question would be general revelation is just that. It's general to all mankind. Whereas special revelation is unique, and its purpose is to reveal truth, but the means by which the truth comes is through Jesus Christ and the Scriptures. And of course, the idea of special revelation uh, we have in the Word of God. Well, hopefully that clarifies that question there. Well, this also concludes today's episode. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you'll tune in next time. Until then, God bless.